Welcome to To Life L'Chaim. On today's episode, we're in studio with author Andrew Boston to discuss his latest book, Sharia vs. Freedom, all about Islamic law. We'll be right back with Andrew Boston, right after these messages. Joining us in studio today, we're privileged to have with us Dr. Andrew Bostom. Uh, Dr. Bostom is associate professor at the Warren Alpert Medical School at Brown University. And he's also author of The Legacy of Jihad, three books, The Legacy of Islamic Anti-Semitism, and his newest book called Sharia versus Freedom. Dr. Bostom, thank you very much for joining us on Talai Thanks, thanks for having me. Lee. Um, how does a practicing epidemiologist and professor of medicine begin to study and write about jihad? Uh, it really was uh, a result of, of the 9-11 attacks and um, feeling totally disoriented at the time. Um, I began reading independently uh, and became increasingly alarmed at uh, some of the apologetic presentations that I was seeing, particularly uh, in, in the media, in the academy. Um, and that's really the genesis of, of, of uh, the motivations for, for of writing eventually what turned out to be three books now. I know you use the term uh, apologetic and I've noticed from uh, some of the chapters in your books that you don't distinguish between liberal uh, criticisms of uh, Islam or conservative criticism of Islam um, or promotions of either. You go direct at both. Uh, yeah, I, I feel that, that the uh, cultural relativism, political correctness, however you want to uh, put it, uh, transcends uh, uh, political boundaries in the West. Uh, so you hear this, uh, you, you hear these apologetic arguments from both the left uh, and, and the right. Um, and I think, um, again, it's been one of the motivations for trying to go directly to the sources, uh, the Islamic sources, which outline the doctrine, um, and then both Muslim and non-Muslim sources, which describe the conquests, um, and uh, uh, much uh, additional documentary evidence, uh, which I think gives a, a more complete and honest narrative about what's, what's transpired in the past, and, and, and the past is prologue to what we're seeing now. Three books, over 2,300 pages of uh, research, essays, very comprehensive. Would you describe uh, Islam as a religion of peace or a religion of extremists? Um, Islam itself means submission, and I think that is an actually an accurate uh, depiction of, of the quintessence uh, of Islam. It is, it is, in many respects, a highly politicized uh, ideology in addition to having religious aspects to it, um, and it has a global mission. Uh, it, it, is, it, it will accept achieving its global mission, which is to impose Islamic law um, on, on uh, uh, literally across the globe. Um, and it does this uh, via jihad, which, is a, which, is, which can be violent warfare. It can also just be propaganda. Um, and so it, it, it is, in the end, promoting its own vision of peace. In other words, if the world submits to Islam and to Islamic law, there will be a Pax Islamica. Now, this might be acceptable to pious Muslims, but it's clearly unacceptable uh, to those that come out of the Western tradition and many other non-Muslim traditions. What is uh, jihad? Uh, jihad is really a form of warfare. Uh, it, is, it is an institution in Islam. It is a central pillar uh, of Islam. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be, again, violent warfare, but, it, but as I've documented certainly in, in the three books, uh, it, it primarily is a form of warfare. Uh, it derives from Quranic injunctions, uh, Islam's most sacred text. It's elaborated further in additional uh, canonical texts of Islam, the so-called traditions, uh, and it's also a major part of Islamic uh, jurisprudence. Um, and essentially, uh, it is the mission to spread Islam across the globe and impose uh, Islamic law. Now, this doesn't always have to be done uh, via warfare. It can be done by other techniques, propagandistic techniques, etc., uh, th or the threat of violence. Um, but but, it, but it is, that is its primary purpose. It, it, is, it is to propagate uh, Islam. Most commentators, when uh, they show clips of 
uh, radicals in uh, various countries across the, the Middle East or Southeast Asia and North Africa. Um, they talk about it in terms of extremism. Um, your research talks about it in terms of mainstreamism. What supports your research? Yeah, I, I, I think, again, if, if we get back to something as fundamental as the doctrine of jihad, it's a mainstream doctrine. Um, it, it derives literally from, from, the, from the, 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 the sunnah, the practice of, of Muhammad himself. Muhammad uh, was a proselytizer, but he also was a prototype jihadist. He waged many violent campaigns during his lifetime. And towards the end of his life, it became clear to his followers, through some of his own actions and through some of his own teachings, that, that this type of warfare was to be extended beyond the boundaries uh, of Arabia. Um, and so uh, if, if uh, Muhammad is held up, and he still is, obviously, and we, and we see the great outcry when there's cartoons, et cetera, et cetera, that supposedly insult him, Muhammad is the role model eternally for Muslims, uh, then we see that uh, insinuated into mainstream Islam uh, is, is the notion uh, of jihad against the infidel. And we see it institutionally from, from all the, the major teaching uh, institutions uh, in Islam, uh, Sunni and Shiite alike, uh, those are the two major branches, mm -hmm. uh, which still teach the doctrine of, of jihad, holy war, uh, to this day, uh, unreformed, uh, unrepentant. Um, and we also see um, polling data which, which suggests that even in the modern era, uh, two-thirds of Muslims uh, across the length and breadth of Islam favor the recreation of Islam's uh, 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 multinational state, the caliphate, uh, which was dissolved under Ataturk uh, officially back in 1925. Two-thirds of Muslims favor the recreation of a caliphate. Two-thirds of Muslims favor the reestablishment, and the word is strict, of strict Sharia law. This comes out of uh, survey data from 2006-07. What is a caliphate? Define that. Yeah, the caliphate was the, was the transnational Muslim state, uh, again, which, which was alluded to, uh, uh, jurists argued, uh, in, in the Quran itself. Um, and then was, was uh, actualized by the foundational Muslim dynasties, which uh, burst it's, out of Arabia. It's a doctrine. It's, it's, it's a doctrine of, of, uh, of, of global domination uh, via Islam, but, but, it, but, it, but it, it materialized. In mm -hmm. other words, there were, there were multiple uh, caliphates, so-called caliphates. Uh, that derive from the uh, foundational Islamic dynasties, uh, the, the original uh, four successors of, of Muhammad through many other iterations, uh, and the last one was, was via the Turks, the Ottoman Turks. We have a lot to get to today, um, but first we have to break. But when we come back, we're going to discuss uh, Islamic anti-Semitism, um, what's currently happening uh, around the world, and uh, we'll address more. Okay. We'll be right back after these messages. We're back with Dr. Andrew Bostom. Um, doctor, uh, you've written three books, uh, 700 pages each. Uh, the second one entitled Islamic Anti-Semitism. And that seems like a given. So why was it necessary to write 700 pages on Islamic anti-Semitism? I, I think you're, you're right. At one level, uh, it, it, um, particularly when you look at the pronouncements of, unfortunately, of Muslim clerics and leaders, it does seem so in your face. What I felt was completely misunderstood about Islamic anti-Semitism was the Islam in Islamic anti-Semitism. In other words, it was constantly being portrayed as um, some legacy of the West, another, yet, another, yet another problem with the Western colonial project where this evil seed was implanted in an otherwise pure and even philo-Semitic Islam by Westerners. And I wanted to demonstrate that this, is, this is, uh, turns reality on its head, that it's, that it's in the foundational texts of Islam, that it's in the early Islamic societies that, that we could identify 
And I went into great detail to demonstrate that and that it's much more of a continuum. Mm -hmm. There are certain Western elements that have been grafted onto it, you know, secondarily, you know, particularly uh, beginning in the, in, the, in the 20th century, um, but that if all those disappeared overnight, if, if, if uh, the protocols of the elders of Zion were never distributed and Nazi motifs were never reproduced, there would be this vast corpus completely independent of those ideas that would still persist. Mm -hmm. I, with respect to uh, your, your third book, Sharia versus Freedom, on page 36, uh, you put in context uh, the historical pr perspective of anti-Semitism. And you write that Isla Islamic tenet believes whenever a Jew is killed, it is for the benefit of Islam. Please this, explain this. This was very striking. I, I, I'll just give a little quick background as fast as I can. That, that this was, this was, these were the words of a Sufi Indian Muslim, Sir Hindi, who never had contact with a Jew in his life as far as I could glean. And here he was, far removed from physical contact with Jews, and yet repeating this doctrinal idea. Um, and it struck me that, that this, this in and of itself blows up the false notion that somehow Islam has been immune to anti-Semitism. Uh, it turns out that it was is part of an anti-Hindu tract mm -hmm. and it just jumped out at me and going back I could see that the foundational sources of Islam, the Quran, the Hadith, uh, the, the biographies of Muhammad, were rife with a whole gamut of anti-Semitic motifs um, that really owed nothing to the West. I think many people though are, are, are under the false impression that uh, anti-Semitism, Islamic anti-Semitism, really came into being with the formation of the State of Israel. But your research shows that it's obviously gone on for centuries before that. No, unfortunately the Quran is rife with anti-Semitic motifs. Uh, you know, the, the, the Jews as, as, as corruptors of Allah's message uh, to all the monotheistic peoples, uh, the Jews as murderers of Muhammad. Again, this, may, this shows some parallels perhaps to the deicide uh, allegation. Uh, the, the Jews engaged in conspiratorial activities to sabotage the early Islamic State and then taking this on uh, through history um, and, and deserving uh, punishment both in this world and the hereafter for that kind of nefarious behavior. This all is part of, of, of the central, uh, Islamic, uh, central Islamic teachings and, and message. Um, and, and I think uh, that, that this is something that, that has been neglected uh, or ignored or denied for, for a long period of time. And, and, and we see it in full force now. Um, and perhaps what, what the Zionist Project has done uh, is with the ingathering of the Jews to Israel um, has enraged uh, really mainstream Islam in the sense that the Jews were supposed to remain subjugated and humiliated as so-called dhimmi, and this is according to Quran 929. D-H-I-M-M-I. -M -M -I. Yes, that's how, it tra that's how it's written in English. Um, and, and they have liberated themselves from this status that, that, that is supposed to be their sacralized status according to Islamic law. And, and that ties into some end of times uh, uh, ideas in Islam, which, which require the destruction of the Jews to us, usher in the Messianic age. Mm -hmm. um, so this is all coming together now with the ingathering of the Jews uh, to Israel and their liberation from the Sharia. Even as I sit here discussing it, I know some of our viewers are going, this is a bigoted conversation. And why is it not? Yeah, it's, it's, it's rather striking uh, that that simply um, exposing what these mainstream doctrines are, let alone the history, which we'll have, you know, we won't have time perhaps to get into very much, um, it's, it, it, it's, it's turning reality on its head. Uh, we're, having, we're having a straightforward conversation um, about, about doctrine mostly, uh, and we can, we can hear it repeated uh, by mainstream clerics. Uh, I give the example of the late Grand Imam of Al-Azhar University, which, which is the Sunni, the Sunni Islamic equivalent of the Vatican. He served for 14 years, and his claim to fame, his magnum opus, is a 700-page treatise identifying and extolling for all times the most virulent anti-Semitic motifs in the Quran and the traditions of, of Muhammad. And he wasn't, he wasn't vilified for this. 
he was elevated to the equivalent of, of the position of the Muslim Pope, where he mm -hmm. served for 14 years from 1996 until 2010. And to me, that, that captures um, in, in, in one profoundly depressing scenario the, the, the problem with mainstream Islam. Is there a genesis moment? A genesis moment in this, in terms of Islamic anti-Semitism, dating back hundreds oh, of years. Is oh, there a well, genesis, mo yeah, genesis moment? It, it, it's 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 been argued that that uh, the Jews rejecting Muhammad as as their prophet too uh, is 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 when he really turns. Uh, he did appeal to them initially, um, and they were they mocked him. They were stunned that he would make such a claim. I mean, he wasn't one of them. He mm -hmm. you know he was he was uh, an, an Arab. And, and he, um, he didn't understand their doctrines very well. Uh, and, and, and again, it was, it was mockery. Uh, and uh, I, I think if, if, there is, if there is such a teachable moment, it, it, it would be the Jews' rejection of, of Muhammad as, as, their, uh, as, their, as their Messiah. Okay, we got another break. And uh, when we come back, we're gonna get into uh, Sharia law in greater depth. Okay. We'll be right back after these messages. We're back in studio with Dr. Andrew Bostom. Doctor, what is Sharia law? Uh, Sharia law is, is in many respects the quintessence of Islam. Uh, it, is, it is doctrines that cover the full gamut of life. It's really a totalitarian uh, doctrine in that sense. It covers everything from waging warfare uh, to matters of hygiene, to matters of politics, to mat matters of, 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 of criminal law. Uh, and it derives, again, from Islam's foundational sources, the Quran, the Hadith, uh, the, the uh, biographies of Muhammad, uh, and also from a whole range of, of Muslim jurisprudence, uh, religious so law. Is it a separate document within the Quran, or is it woven through the Quran? It's, th there, are, there are literally sections of the Quran that, re that, that, that iterate laws. Uh, and, and there are there are elements of the, of the hadith uh, which get into specific uh, laws and behaviors, um, but again, it's it's a holistic uh, doctrine which 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 covers again uh, very very basic matters of hygiene as well. Um, uh, but you can see examples in terms of of, uh, of penal law. Uh, so, um, and, and things that we would regard in this day and age as very draconian, you know, still stoning adulterers, lashing people who drink alcohol, um, amput amputating, mutilating uh, people who engage in theft, things like that. There are, there are concrete uh, aspects of it. Um, and That's then, crazy. That doesn't really happen. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah, is uh, that? Yeah, yeah that, that, that is a reaction. And uh, I document in, in Sharia versus Freedom, uh, the application of those kinds of penalties. Mm -hmm. Now, with, with the contact between Islamdom in the West and actually the period of, of Western colonization, a lot of the Sharia was, if not temporarily abrogated, was rolled back and, and, and attempts were made to institute British law, French law, Dutch law, et cetera, et cetera. What we're seeing in our age is, is in the post-colonial period, is a, is a lot of those rickety institutions have fallen by the wayside and full-blown Sharia is, is coming back. So, so I do give examples of some of these heinous penalties, you know, amputations, mm -hmm. um, stoning in, in, in women in, for so-called adultery in, in, in Iran. Um, and worse yet, though, is that what never really disappeared was the Sharia's rejection of our foundational Western freedoms of conscience and speech. And we're seeing this come back full force now with the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which used to be known as the Organization of the Islamic Conference, which is trying to, it's 57 member nations, so, the, so all the major Muslim uh, populations in the world, Muslim major nations in the world, um, are trying to impose on Western instruments, like the Bill of Rights, like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, this so-called Cairo Declaration, which says that Sharia overarches these human, modern human rights constructs, and that we have to go back to accepting um, that, that you can't criticize Islam, you certainly can't criticize Islam's prophet Muhammad, and if you do, Sharia punishments for blasphemy should be applied, or people who leave Islam, even if they're in Muslim communities in the West, are potentially 
committing a, a, an act of treason, which is how Islam views apostasy, and they too should be punished. Mm -hmm. um, so we're beginning to see the re-emergence of, 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 of the attempt to internationalize Islam, which actually has, again, ancient roots in terms of Islam seeing itself as a universal system and mission. But I think many people would say that is over there. That's yeah. in the Middle East. It's not here. We have U.S. courts, U.S. laws. There's nothing to fear with respect to Sharia law. Yeah, and it's breaking down, and it's breaking down as we as as we speak. Uh, so? we're, we're seeing we're seeing um, the uh, for example in the reactions to this to this uh, uh, trailer that that was made of, uh, by by a, a, a Coptic Christian, um, you know, which included uh, unflattering commentary on Islam's prophet. Uh, we're seeing uh, the attempt to to insinuate Islamic blasphemy law and, and punish people in the United States. Um, and we also know that the Muslim communities in the United States institutionally, not, not at the level of individual Muslims, uh, are sanctioning behaviors that, that we, we would find radical. They are, they are sanctioning the application of, of Sharia. 81% uh, of, of US mosques in a very carefully done uh, population sample study uh, are fomenting jihad. Uh, we have the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America, which covers North Canada and, and the United States, issuing fatwas that sound as obscurantist about these kinds of issues, apostasy, blasphemy, child marriage, female genital mutilation, as anything that you would get out of the Middle East itself. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in the presence of American criminal law, um, it can't be acted upon yet, but, but that is the goal and that is the advice given to Muslims as to how they might wish to behave in North America. So to, to, so to pretend that these phenomena are not going on in, in the West is just delusional. Are you an, are you an Islamophobe? <laughs> um, I think that I think it's 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 an invented and ridiculous term. I, I, I think I think it's a term that's used to, to attempt to silence, <laughs> to impose Islamic blasphemy law on people who want a rational discussion of these issues, who've studied the doctrine, who've studied its application across space and time, and are very concerned that we don't surrender our hard-won freedoms. Uh, to this kind of system which is completely antithetical and alien uh, to everything that, that uh, brave Americans have fought for. We have about a minute and a half uh, left and uh, really quickly, uh, obviously with what's transpired in Egypt with the election of President Morsi um, and how he spoke to his crowds on his uh, election day. Um, in terms of the Quran is our constitution, the Prophet Muhammad is our leader. Uh, the crowds would say the Prophet Muhammad is our leader. Muhammad Morsi would say jihad is our path. Um, do we have a lot to fear from Egypt? Look, absolutely. Uh, all Morsi was doing is repeating the Muslim Brotherhood creed as, as articulated by its founder back in 1928-29, Hassan al-Banna. And they are now popularly elected. They are, they are both, rep both reflecting uh, the, the masses and reiterating those sorts of sentiments which are widespread uh, in Egypt uh, and obviously have, have national and international ramifications. And quickly, in about 20 seconds, uh, if someone wants to learn more um, on your writings, uh, where can they get in touch with you? Uh, best is the website, uh, www.andrewbostom.org. Dr. Bostom, it's been a pleasure having you with us today on Talaif Chaim. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. much. That's it for this edition. For more information on our show, please visit us on the web at talifelechaim.com. I'm Lee Lazarson. Thank you very much for joining us. And Talif Lechaim. <laughs>